What a morning. What a day already. Okay, friends, I just wanted to get this started because I'm I'm late getting it going, but I've still got to get all my books and everything set up, so I'm just going to kind of do that while, um, while people are coming in. So Shabbat Shalom. I hope you're having a shalomy kind of day. <laughs> Mine has been a little bit... Um, well, it was going great. Everything was super peaceful until it was time to get ready to do this. And then everything just kind of went a little nuts. Um, I was putting in my contacts and because these headbands that I love to wear, they don't seem to sit well behind my ears with my glasses on. So I wanted to put my contacts in. Well, then my contacts refused to settle <laughs> and I couldn't see, like I have astigmatism. So they, my contacts have to sit a certain way in my eyes. And if they don't settle, I, I can't, my eyes can't focus for me to be able to see and they wouldn't settle. Um, so I had to go take my contacts out. Then I couldn't get one of my contacts to get out of my eye. It, it's just, it's been, it's been interesting. So today uh, is going to be a little bit of a longer kind of video and among my challenges, my phone refused to connect to charge. It's just been, this is going to be a longer video because we are going to be discussing the spring biblical beasts today. Um, and we'll get into that as soon as I get done with the weekly scripture reading. Um, it is not going to be an exhaustive study. It will be long, but if we, if, 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 if it was exhaustive, we would be here all day or days. Um, but I've got lots of scriptures that we're going to go through with that. And then I have a couple, um, books that I've talked about before, but I'll share them again that I, I recommend if you're wanting to learn more. Um, but first... Let's read our scriptures for today. Let me turn my ringer off. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who gives the Torah of truth and the good news of salvation to your people Israel and to all people through your Son, Yeshua the Messiah, our Lord and Savior. Amen. All right. And I've got some tissues in my pocket just in case I start sneezing because pine pollen doesn't bother me, but pine wood shavings, which are in the brooder right next to me, do. So I, I'm, I'm fine lately because most of my allergies are done for this for the spring, but they make me sneeze. So I end up sneezing as soon as I come into the greenhouse. All right, so today we are reading in the book of Leviticus, in the Torah, which we're, which is where we are at. And then we will be reading in Deuteronomy, 1 Samuel, and in Revelation. Tomorrow is uh, Purim, which begins tonight. Um, it is the celebration of victory over Haman, a man who hated all of the Jews and tried to trick the king into slaughtering them all, including his wife and they had victory over him and so that's the story of the book of esther if you want to familiarize yourself with it um, it is frequently celebrated in lots of fun ways and i and i talked about this um in last week's study or in last week's scripture day saturday all right leviticus chapter five we're going to be reading verse 11 and we're going to read through the end of the chapter. In some Bibles, depending upon how yours is numbered, that may be um, chapter 6, verse 7. Um, or it's simply the end of chapter 5. Because not all Bibles are numbered the same way. So we, we just got done going through where uh, if someone sins and don't realize they have or, or did it through ignorance what they needed to do for their offering. 
Um, it was a lamb. If they couldn't afford a lamb, then it was pigeons. And now we're picking up where even if they're too poor for that. But if his means are in insufficient, even for two doves or two young pigeons, then he is to bring as his offering for the sin he committed two quarts of fine flour for a sin offering. He is not to put any olive oil or frankincense on it because it is a sin offering. He is to bring it to the Kohen, the priest, and the Kohen is to take a handful of it as a reminder portion and make it go up in smoke on the altar on top of the offerings for Adonai made by fire. It is a sin offering. Thus the Kohen will make atonement for him in regard to the sin he committed concerning any of these things, and he will be forgiven. The rest will belong to the Kohenim, as with a grain offering. Adonai said to Moshe, Moses, If anyone acts improperly and inadvertently sins in regard to the holy things of Adonai, he is to bring as his guilt offering for Adonai a ram without defect from the flock, or its equivalent in silver shekels, using the sanctuary shekel as a standard. According to your appraisal of its value, it is a guilt offering. In addition, he is to make restitution for whatever he did wrong in regard to the holy thing. Moreover, he is to add to that one-fifth and give it to the Kohen. Then the Kohen will make atonement with the ram of the guilt offering, and he will be forgiven. If someone sins by doing something against any of my mitzvot, my commands, of Adonai concerning the things which should not be done, he is guilty, even if he is unaware of it, and he bears the consequences of his wrongdoing. He must bring a ram without defect from the flock or its equivalent, according to your appraisal. To the Kohen for a guilt offering, the Kohen will make atonement concerning the error which he committed, even though he was unaware of it, and he will be forgiven. It is a guilt offering. He is certainly guilty before Adonai. Adonai said to Moshe, If someone sins and acts perversely against Adonai by dealing falsely with his neighbor in regard to a deposit or security entrusted to him by stealing from him, by extorting him, or by dealing falsely in regard to a lost object he has found, or by swearing to a lie. If a person commits any of these sins, then he has sinned and is guilty. He is to restore whatever it was he stole or obtained by extortion, or whatever was deposited with him, or the lost object which he found. No such thing as finders keepers with the Lord or anything about which he has sworn falsely. He is to restore it in full, plus an additional one-fifth. He must return it to the person who owns it on the day when he presents his guilt offering. He is to bring as his guilt offering to Adonai a ram without defect from the flock or its equivalent, according to your appraisal. To the Kohen, it is a guilt offering. Thus, the Kohen will make atonement for him by before Adonai, and he will be forgiven in regard to whatever it was he did that made him guilty. Next, we're going to jump over to Deuteronomy, chapter 25. And we're going to be reading 17 through 19 in chapter 25. Remember what Amalek did to you on the road as you were coming out of Egypt, how he met you by the road, attacked those in the rear, those who were exhausted and straggling behind when you were tired and weary. He did not fear God. Therefore, when Adonai your God has given you rest from all your surrounding enemies in the land Adonai your God has given you as your inheritance to possess, you are to blot out all memory of Amalek under, from under heaven. Don't forget. And just as an aside, Esther, um, the story of Esther is again about the um, defeat of Haman, or yeah, Haman, who, by the way, was a descendant of Amalek, because the people of Israel did not do what God said to, and because they did not blot him out completely, his descendants came back to cause lots of trouble afterwards. All right, First Samuel, chapter 15, and we're going to read verses 2 through 34. And I know I'm kind of scooting through these scriptures today, but we've got a lot to get to after, after all of this. 
chapter, chapter 15, verses 2 to 34. Here's what Adonai Tzavot says. I remember what Amalek did to Israel, how they fought against Israel when they were coming up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and completely destroy everything they have. Don't spare them, but kill men, women, children, babies, cows, sheep, camels, and donkeys. Shaul summoned the people and reviewed them in Talaim, 200,000 foot soldiers with another 10,000 men from Yehuda, Judah. Shaul arrived at the city of Emelech and lay in wait in the valley. Shaul said to the Kenai, Go away, withdraw, leave your homes there with the, em em the Amalekites. Otherwise, I might destroy you along with them, even though you were kind to all the people of Israel when they came out of Egypt. So the Kenai, so the, Kenai the Canaanites, went away from among the Amalekites. When Shaul attacked Amalekh, starting at Havilah, and continuing towards Shur at the border of Egypt. He, t he took Agag, the king of Amalek, alive, but he completely destroyed the people, putting them to the sword. However, Shaul, and that's King Saul, and the people spared Agag along with the best of the sheep and the cattle and even the second best and also the lambs and everything that was good. They weren't inclined to destroy these things, but everything that was worthless or weak or they completely destroyed. Then the word of Adonai came to, to Samuel, I regret setting up Shaul as king because he has turned his back from following me and hasn't obeyed my orders. This made Samuel very sad, so he cried to Adonai all night. Samuel got up early in the morning to meet Shaul. However, Samuel was told Shaul came to Carmel to set up a monument for himself there. But now he has left and is on his way down to Gilgal. Samuel went to Shaul and said to him, Shaul said to him, May Adonai bless you. I have done what Adonai ordered. But Samuel answered, If so, why do I hear sheep bleeding and cows mooing? Saul said, They brought them from the Amalekites, because the people spared the best of the sheep and the cattle to sacrifice to Adonai your God. But we completely destroyed the rest. Then Samuel said to Saul, Stop. I'm going to tell you what Adonai said to me last night. He said, Speak. Samuel then said, You may be small in your own sight, but you are head of the tribes of Israel. Adonai anointed you king over Israel. Now Adonai sent you on a mission and told you, Go and completely destroy Amalek, those sinners, and keep making war on them until they have been exterminated. Why did you seize the spoil instead of paying attention to what Adonai said? From Adonai's viewpoint, you have done an evil thing. Saul said to Samuel, I I did too pay attention to what Adonai said. I carried out the mission on which Adonai sent me. I brought back Agag, the king of Amalek, and I completely destroyed Amalek. But the people took some of the spoil, the best of the sheep and the cattle set aside for destruction, to sacrifice to Adonai your god in Gilgal. Samuel said, Does Adonai take much pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying what Adonai says? Surely obeying is better than sacrifice, and heeding orders than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of sorcery, stubbornness like the crime of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of Adonai, he too has rejected you as king. Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated the order of Adonai and your words too, because I was afraid of the people and listened to what they said. Now please pardon my sin and come back with me so that I can worship Adonai. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not go back with you because you have rejected the word of Adonai and Adonai has rejected you as king over Israel. As, as Samuel was turning around to leave, he took hold of the hem of his cloak and it tore. Samuel said to him, Adonai has torn the kingdom of Israel away from you today and given it to a fellow countryman of yours who is better than you. Moreover, the Eternal One of Israel will not lie or change his mind, because he isn't a mere human being subject to changing his mind. Then Saul said, I have sinned, but in spite of that, please show me respect now before the, elder, the leaders of my people and before Israel by coming back with me so that I can worship Adonai your God. It's all, it always interests me how he always says, Sam, Adonai your God. He doesn't say Adonai our God. So Samuel followed Saul back, and Saul worshipped Adonai. Then Samuel said, Bring Agag the king of Emelech to hear to me. Agag came to him in chains and said, without a, doubt, without a doubt, mine will be a bitter death. Samuel said, Just as your sword has left women childless, so will your mother be left childless among, among women. Then Samuel cut Agag in pieces before Adonai and Gilgal. Samuel returned to Ramah, 
and Shaul went up to his house in Gibat Shaul. And never again did Samuel see Shaul until the day he died. But Samuel grie grieved over Saul, and Adonai regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. I just finished the chapter because there's one more verse. All right, and next we're going to flip over to Revelation. And we're going to be in chapter 18, and we're going to read the whole chapter. Revelation chapter 18. <laughs> After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority. The earth was lit up by his splendor, and he cried out in a strong voice, She has fallen, she has fallen, Babel the Great. She has become a home for demons, a prison for every unclean spirit, a prison for every unclean hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of God's fury causing, caused by her whoring. Yes, the kings of the earth went whoring with her, and from her unrestrained love of luxury, the world's businessmen have grown rich. Then I heard another voice out of heaven say, My people come out of her, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not be infected by her plagues. For her sins are a sticky mass of a mass piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Render to her as she has rendered to others. Pay her back double for what she has done. Use the cup in which she has brewed to brew her a double-sized drink. Give her as much torment and sorrow as the glory and luxury she gave herself. For in her heart she says, I sit a queen. I am not a widow. I will never see sorrow. Therefore her plagues will come in a single day, death, sorrow, and famine and she will be burned with fire, because Adonai God, her judge, is mighty. The kings of the earth, who went whoring with her and shared her luxury, will sob and wail over her when they see the smoke that she, as she burns. Standing at a dis distance for fear of her torment, they will say, Oh no, the great city, Babel, the mighty city, in a single hour your judgment has come. The world's business, businessmen weep and mourn over her because no one is buying their merchandise anymore. Stocks of gold and silver, gems and pearls, fine linen and purple, silk and scarlet, all rare woods and ivory goods, all kinds of things made of scented wood, brass, iron and marble, cinnamon, cardamom, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, flour, grain, cattle, sheep, horses, chariots and bodies, people's souls. The fruits you lusted for with all your heart have gone, and the luxury and flashiness have been destroyed, never to return. The sellers of these who got rich from her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and mourning and saying, Oh no, the great city used to wear fine linen, purple and scarlet. She glittered with gold, precious stones and pearls, such great wealth in a single hour ruined. All the shipmasters, passengers, sailors, and everyone making his living from the sea stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke as she burned. What city like the great sea? What city was like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads as they wept and mourned, saying, Oh no, the great city, the abundance of her wealth, made all the ship owners rich in a single hour she's ruined. Rejoice over her heaven. Rejoice, people of God. Emissaries and prophets, for in judging her, God has vindicated you. Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a great millstone and hurled it into the sea, saying, With violence like this will the great city Babel be hurled down never to be found again. The sound of harpists and musicians, flute players and trumpeters will never again be heard in you. No worker of any trade will ever again be found in you. No sound of a mill will ever be again be heard in you. The light of a lamp will never again shine in you. The voice of a bridegroom and, groom and bride will never again be heard in you. For your businessmen were the most powerful on earth. All the nations were deceived by your magic spell. In her was found the blood of prophets and of God's people. Indeed, all of you who have ever been slaughtered on earth. All right. That is the scriptures for today. And you'll be able to get the entire week's schedule on my website. Um, the printable version is already there and I will update the page to display those uh, later this evening. All right. Um, the Bible version that I read from primarily is the complete Jewish study Bible. Um, it is the Old and New Testament. It's the complete scriptures. It is just a translation that I find to be 
uh, my favorite. I also use the NASB and the TLV at times, but the CJV has become my go-to version, so people often ask me which version I'm reading from. And as we go through scriptures now, because we're about to start talking about the fall feast, or the spring feast, excuse me, um, all of the references that I read from, or that I read, will also be from um, the CJB version, um, except for a certain portion that I will mention. All right, I've got lots of notes here. Um, I do have the chat turned off just because there is so much to get through. Uh, and I also, I'm easily distracted by the live chat and um, I, d I don't have people lined up to be moderating for me on Shabbat. And so that's why I usually turn it off unless I forget to, because live chats have a tendency to draw the trolls, um, especially if it's Bible or scripture related, though that's, you know, the enemy just likes to do things using people. All right. So, as I mentioned, tonight begins Purim, because technically Purim is tomorrow, but the Hebrew calendar works sunset to sunset, sunset, to sunset. We use, most of the world use the, uses the Gregorian calendar, which is, and in, in the, the day, the calendar days are midnight to midnight. And so, when you're looking at the calendar, um, this journal that I use, it's from Daily Bread for Busy Moms, um, and it has all of the scripture readings. When you look at the calendar, it says here March 23rd, which is today as we would know it. But tonight at sunset, it will become the 13th of Adar. And so it is Purim Eve tonight. So Purim Eve, of course, doesn't start till evening. And that's where that'll be. Um, there, there is a lot of confusion at times when it comes to the calendar. Um, but once you kind of get the hang of it, it's, it's pretty easy to understand. Um, and that, that'll kind of play a role in what we get into here. Um, and in addition to the, the days being a little bit different than our days that we're used to, the months, of course, are different. And, um, so currently right now it's the month of Adar in the Hebrew calendar and the Hebrew calendar is based on the moon it's a lunar calendar so every time there's a new moon which we would know as no moon that is the end of the previous previous month and the moment the very night that you see the tiniest little sliver that is the beginning of the new month and so um, it's a little bit different than us. And they do, the Hebrew calendar does have leap years, but instead of being every four years where we add an extra day, um, and I, I forget off the top of my head, I didn't look at this part before I got started, uh, it's every so many years, they actually have a leap month. And I'll have to pardon, the, I just realized I left one of my dogs outside and he's barking because there's a car going down the road. Actually, I think it was the mail lady. Um, hold on. Okay. Um, the Spring Feast. This is something that I have had a lot of questions about. I get questions about them every year. And I, t I touch on them every year. And I go into them a little bit. But I thought, you know, let's, let's start talking about them a little bit more in depth. And as in depth as I go today, this is still really only an introduction to it. Um, I'm, I'm going to go through all of the spring feasts. Originally, I thought, well, I could do like one spring feast one week, the next one the next week and do it like that. But they are so interconnected that it's really almost impossible to talk about one without talking about the others. And so I'm just going to go through um, the spring feasts in order. And these are the God's appointed times. Okay, so Purim is 
not not commanded by the Lord. That is from the book of Esther, but it and it is a wonderful celebration in remembrance of a victory that took place over the enemies of God of God's people. But it's not appointed by the Lord. It's not mandated by the Lord to keep. These, however, were given to us by the Father in Exodus, Levit Leviticus, Deuteronomy, uh, Numbers. It, it, it's, it's repeated. And so we're just going to kind of go through these in the order that they come on the calendar. And um, we're going to talk about Passover. Uh, we're going to talk about um First fruits. We're going to talk about counting Gomer. We're going to talk about Pentecost, uh, and so we're just going to go through all of these. Um, and there's going to be a lot of scripture that we're going to go through. Uh, I have all of the ones that I'm going to read here, and um, if if someone wants a copy of this later on, I will um, I'll make a PDF of this and. Put it on the scripture reading page where it's linked that you could download a PDF of it. And Shanti's going to bark like crazy because Mr. Smith just pulled in the driveway. <laughs> um, so just ignore my dog for a moment. Mr. Smith will put him in the house in a minute when he goes in there. All right, so the first thing we're going to talk about is Passover. Hold on just a moment, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> He's gonna keep barking until you let him in. All right, Passover. Passover, of course, comes from Exodus. When all of the, the people of God, the Hebrews, the Israelites, were in bondage in Egypt. When af after they had gone through all of the plagues, you know, with Moses and Aaron going before Pharaoh saying, let my people go or this will happen. Let my people go and then it's the next plague. You know, we just went through all of that. Um, the final plague was, of course, the slaughter of the firstborns of every household, human and animals. And so it came from that evening when the angel of death was going to come through and, and do this slaughter. The Lord commanded his people, told Moses, tell your people, my people, to slaughter a lamb and put the blood on the doorposts of their homes and by that blood I will know that these are my people these are the obedient people and death will pass them over and so let's first go into Exodus chapter 6 verses 6 through 8 therefore say to the people of Israel I am Adonai I will free you from the forced labor of the Egyptians rescue you from their oppression and redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments I will take you as my people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am Adonai, your God, who freed you from the forced labor of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land, which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you as your inheritance. I am Adonai. And then in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 4 through 14, this is after they have come out of slavery, after they have been you know, they've gone through the Red Sea, the Sea of Suf. Um, Pharaoh's army is you know, washed away with the floodwaters. And now he's, Moses has received the laws of God and, and is giving them and teaching them to the people. So Leviticus, of course, that is the law. Leviticus chapter 23, verses 4 through 14. These are the designated times of Adonai, the holy convocations you are to, pro to proclaim at their designated times. Leviticus 23 is all about the feasts of the Lord. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, between sundown and complete darkness, becomes, comes Pesach, 
which is Passover, for Adonai. On the 15th day of the same month is the festival of Matzah. So you've got two festivals that really go right smack together. Passover and Matzah, unleavened bread. For seven days you are to eat matzah. On the first day you are to have a holy convocation. Don't do any kind of ordinary work. Bring an offering made by fire to Adonai for seven days. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. Do not do any kind of ordinary work. Adonai said to Moshe, tell the people of Israel, after you enter the land I am giving you and harvest its ripe crops, you are to bring a sheaf of the first fruits to your harvest, of your harvest to the Kohen. He is to wave the sheaf before Adonai so that you will be accepted. The Kohen is to wave it on the day after the Shabbat, the Sabbath. That's the weekly Sabbath. On the day that you wave the sheaf, you are to make a take a, offer a male lamb without defect in its first year as a burnt offering for Adonai. Its grain offering is to be one gallon of fine flour mixed with olive oil. An offering made by fire to Adonai is a fragrant aroma. Its drink offering is to be of wine one quart. You are not to eat bread, dried grain, or fresh grain until the day you you bring the offering for your God. This is a permanent regulation throughout all your generations, no matter where you live. And, and I'm sorry, I misspoke. That's um, The Kohen is to wave it on the day after Shabbat. That's the day after... Um, oh, no, that's, it. that's right. Never mind. Disregard. First fruits. That's the other one. The next piece getting tongue-tied trying to go too quickly that is the next feast we will discuss we're gonna, just going to kind of do an overview and then go through them all but one one thing i want to make note of is this is a permanent regulation throughout all your generations no matter where you live permanent means permanent if if the lord wanted something to be temporary he would say until the time appointed or until this or you know but he says it's permanent so just keep that in mind. And, and something else that right in the very beginning, Leviticus 23, chapter verse 5, it says, in the first month on the 14th day. So spring, when Passover takes place, the Lord calls it the beginning of the year. This is the first month. There's a lot of controversy over calendars. Um, and there's a lot of traditions that were accepted. If you look at, if you even look at this, this uses, as far as the calendar goes, it shows the beginning of the year being in the fall. And it, it has... It has the schedule, Genesis 1-1, starting in the fall, after the fall feasts. Except, the Bible says very clearly, the first month of the year is in the springtime. So, there's different um, viewpoints and, and everything. There was a teaching that I listened to that, that said that basically this idea of the fall being the beginning of year of the year came from when the the Israelites were in Babylonian captivity that it was adopted as the beginning of the new year and it's just like how we have January 1st as being the new year we still celebrate that new year but God does God says that's not the new year the new year is in the spring so that's that's just a little something to keep in mind all right numbers 28. <laughs> Hold on, let me not lose my spot. Okay. Numbers 28, verse 16 to 25. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, is Adonai's Pesach, Passover. On the 15th day of the month is to be a feast. Matzah is to be eaten for seven days. The first day is to be a holy convocation. Do not any, do not do any kind of ordinary work, but present an offering made by fire, a burnt offering to Adonai, consisting of two young bulls, one one ram, and seven male lambs in their first year. They are to be without defect for you. With their grain offering, fine flour mixed with olive oil, offer six quarts for a bull, four quarts for the ram, and two quarts for each of the seven lambs. Also, a male goat is a sin offering to make atonement for you. 
you are to offer these in addition to the morning burnt offering, which is the regular burnt offering. In this fashion, you are to offer daily for seven days the food of the offering made by fire, making a fragrant aroma for Adonai. It is to be offered in addition to the burnt, regular burnt offering and its drink offering. On the seventh day, you are to have a cold holy convocation. Do not do any kind of ordinary work. So what we are seeing is on the 14th day of the first month, which, depending upon where you're reading it, is going to be either... The month of Nisan, sounds kind of like the car brand, the month of Nisan or Abib or Aviv, depending upon where um, where you're reading it. Um, again, Nisan is the name of a month. Um, there are scriptures in the Bible that calls it Abib or Aviv, depending on the translation. Sometimes V's can be translated as V's. And it's the same month. That often causes confusion. Uh, Abib, Aviv, Nisan, same month. So the 14th day of the month, and it is at sunset. I don't know if I have a scripture that I pulled out that, that shows that. Um, it's at sunset. It's between basically twilight and dark. In that time frame is when the Passover feast is supposed to be eaten because that is when they were preparing for the sun's going down, the angel of death is coming in, and during the night the firstborns are slaughtered. And so that is when it is that is when it is done. If a let me not get ahead of myself. Let's talk about the lamb. The lamb was to be without blemish. There couldn't be anything wrong with this lamb. It had to be perfect. The lambs were brought into the home because each family, and, and remember family groups back then, homes usually had multiple generations. And so there was a lot of people per family. So each family would take a lamb into their home on the 10th and they would spend four days taking care of this lamb, looking over this lamb, inspecting this lamb and making sure that there was no blemishes, no faults, nothing more wrong with this ram, this lamb because this lamb had to be perfect. Something of interest is the comparisons between um, the lamb of Passover and Yeshua, Jesus. And I'm gonna go. We're gonna go through some of those scriptures and show you because you know when I was in a traditional church, I was taught every year how Jesus was our Passover lamb. He was the Passover. He was the Passover, and that our Easter celebration was based on Passover. And Jesus was our Passover lamb. And so we're gonna go through some of the things. First of all, there is the fact that the lamb was brought into the home and kept for four days, inspected for four days. Jesus came into Jerusalem on the 10th of Aviv, or Nisan, and he sat there in the temple. And he was examined by the, the, the Torah teachers and the, you know, the Pharisees, the, the religious leaders, and they couldn't find anything to get him on. There was nothing wrong. He had not sinned. So they had to create charges and get false witnesses. To go against him and some of the scripture i'm not going to read all of the scriptures but we've got matthew 21 23 and then 27 verses 1 through 2 verses 11 to 14 17 to 26 we have luke chapter 3 verse 2 we have john 11 49 to 53 he was the perfect lamb of god when the lamb was chosen for Passover, as, as soon as that lamb was chosen, that's the lamb that was going to be sacrificed, as long as it was perfect. When Jesus was born, he was destined for the cross. The lamb for Passover was killed in the afternoon, usually right around three o'clock. 
Yeshua, Jesus, was, was, he died in the seventh hour, which is about three o'clock. And we know that from John 19 and 31. It was preparation day and the Judeans did not want the bodies to remain on the stake on Shabbat since it was an especially important Shabbat. And so they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies removed. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the wrong one. No, no, that was. He was killed in the afternoon before the sun was down. Um, all right, the bones of the lamb were not to be broken. When they slaughtered the lamb, they cut it, they drained its blood, they put it on a, um, a spit, like a, a spike, and they roasted it over a fire. They were, not, they were not allowed to break a single bone in the body of this lamb when they were cooking it. And that is from Exodus 12, 46. It is to be eaten in one house. You are not to take any of the meat outside the house and you are not to break any of its bones. Uh, Numbers 9 and 12. They are to leave none of it until morning. They are not to break any of its bones and they are to observe it according to all the regulations of Passover. This lamb, not a bone broken. And we know the same thing about Jesus. Um, Psalm 34, verses 20 or 19, depending upon which, birth, which one you're using. He protects all his bones, not one of them gets broken. John 19, 32 to 37, the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man who'd been put on a stake beside Yeshua, and then the legs of the other one. But when they got to Yeshua and they saw he was already dead, they didn't break his legs. However, one of the soldiers stabbed his side with a spear and once blood and water, and at once blood and water flowed out. The man who saw it test testified about it and his testimony is true. And he knows that he tells the truth so you too can trust. For these things happen in order to fulfill the, pa the passage of the Tanakh, the Old Testament. Not one of his bones will be broken. Psalm 34, 21 or 20. Exodus 12, 46. Numbers 9 and 12. And again, another passage says, They will look at him whom they have pierced. Zechariah 12 and 10. The lamb's blood for Passover went across the doorposts of the sides and the top of the homes. And everyone who was inside, who was covered by this blood, was protected from death. The blood of Christ, Yeshua, Jesus the Christ, is the covering for us. And it's by his blood we are saved from death, not physical death but spiritual death, the second death. His death was our atonement for sin. 1 John 1, 7 through 9, But if we are walking in the light, and he is in the light, then we have fellowship with, with, with each other, and the blood of his Son, Yeshua, purifies us from all sin. If we claim not to have sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we acknowledge our sins, then, he, then since he is trustworthy and just, he will forgive them and purify us from all wrongdoing. Hebrews 9.14 Then how much more the blood of the Messiah, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself to God as a sacrifice without blemish, will purify our conscience from works that lead to death so that we can serve the living God. Hebrews 12, 24, to the mediator of a new covenant, Yeshua, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks better things than that of Abel. Matthew 26, 28, for this is my blood which ratifies the new covenant, my blood shed on behalf of many so that they may have their sins forgiven. And Revelation chapter 1, the be um, part of 4 through 6. Shalom to you from the one who is, who was, and is coming. From the sevenfold spirit before his throne. And from Yeshua the Messiah, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the earth's kings. To him, the one who loves us, who has freed us from all our sins at the cost of his blood. Who has caused us to be a kingdom that is koanim for God, his father. To him be the glory and the rulership forever and ever. Amen. So, 
Again, the body, the blood of the lamb covered the door, saved them from death. The blood of the lamb, Yeshua Jesus, covers us and, and saves us from our sins, is our atonement and protects us from the forever death. The body of the lamb had to be eaten in one night. There couldn't be any leftovers. Whatever was left over had to be burnt completely with fire and destroyed. There's no, no eating any the next day, no taking some on the road as they were leaving Egypt. It was only then and no more. Exodus 12 verse 8, that night they are to eat the meat roasted in the fire and they are to eat it with matzah and mar. Matzah is, of course, the unleavened bread and mar is bitter herbs. Yeshua was taking taken off the cross and he was buried before sunset and we already read that in verse um, in John 9 verse 31 there was a Shabbat coming and so they couldn't leave his body up on the up on the stake he had to be buried um, before the sun went completely down and so that's that's a comparison for those Passover is a holy convocation. It, it said, you know, when when you have this feast, when you do this remembrance, it is a holy convocation. It is a holy day. It is a, a day of not doing regular work. It is a day of remembering. And um, nothing could save them. No matter what they did, they could have prayed all night. They could have done all the things you could imagine. But the only thing that would save them from the angel of death was the blood of the lamb. The only thing that can save us is the blood of the lamb. Can we do works? Can we be faithful? Can we can we do all the things that we can be to be a, a good child and pleasing to our father? Absolutely. But none of those things bring us our salvation. Only the blood of the lamb. Um, let's see. First Peter. Well, first. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for you have been delivered by grace through trusting. And even if, even this is not your accomplishment, but God's gift, you are not delivered by your own actions. Therefore, no one should boast. In 1 Peter 1, 18 to 21, you should be aware that the ransom paid to free you from the worthless way of life, which your fathers passed on to you, did not consist of anything perishable like silver or gold. On the contrary, it was a costly, bloody, sacrificial death of the Messiah, as of a lamb without defect or spot. God knew him before the founding of the universe, but revealed it, but revealed him in these last days for your sakes. Through him, you trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your trust and hope are in God. It's not by works. It is only by the blood of the Lamb that we are saved and redeemed from wickedness and sin, our old self. So, that that's kind of an overview on the scriptural background of Passover. But I do want to just briefly touch on how Passover is celebrated. Um... And, and and this is again this is just a minor introduction to it um i i will share resources at the end where if you want to learn a lot more and just kind of deep dive into all this you'll be able to do so so one of the major customs for passover is a it's called the haggadah if i'm if i'm pronouncing that right it is a very formal lengthy ceremonial dinner with a um the dinner itself is called the Seder. The Haggadah is like the, the readings and just like the process of the ceremony. Um, and, it, and it can be very, very formal. Um, you, you will often see a Seder plate with different things for um, the symbolism of it. The, the Seder plate itself, that's not scriptural. If you, it is a custom, it is a tradition that's been passed down. There's nothing wrong with it. 
Um, I do think that one of the things that is put on the plate, it kind of bugs me, and that's a hard-boiled egg representing new life. That to me sounds a little bit pagan, and so I personally would not do that. But what is often, um, what you'll often see is like a, a lamb's shank, leg shank bone representing the lamb. Um, there's bitter herbs, there's unleavened bread, uh, there's haroset, which is like a, this apple dish that represents the mortar that was made for the bricks for all of the slavery work that was done in Egypt. Um, but overall, this is a remembrance. And what we are told is in the remembrance of this, in looking back, there's always supposed to be bitter herbs because the bitter herbs remind you of the bitterness of slavery. And whether that was slavery in Egypt or slavery to sin that we are freed from, those bitter herbs remind you of this slavery. You know, and, it, and you saw it where it said with matzah and marrow or mara, bitter herbs and unleavened bread. The unleavened bread is because the people of Israel were going to have to get out of Egypt quickly. The firstborns were being slaughtered. Pharaoh was going to be mad. He's going to say, get out. And they had to go. That's why they had to be wearing their coats, their shoes. They had to be ready to get out the moment they were told to go. There was no time for them to be baking bread. So they had to use matzah, unleavened bread. And we'll talk more about matzah in just a moment. That leads us into unleavened bread, the feast of unleavened bread or the feast of matzah. Now, Passover and matzah are often referred to with the same names. Um, as a matter of fact, in this book, in this journal, when I flip to the week of Passover, you'll see Pesach day one, Pesach day two, day three, day four. They're, called, they're all calling them Pesach or Passover. And so Passover and unleavened bread get lumped together as the same feast. But technically, according to scripture, they're two different ones. It says on the on the 14th the, at sunset, yet you know the beginning, according to the Bible, of the day. That's when you have the Passover meal, and then after that, on the 15th begins the seven days of matzah, unleavened bread. So, um, so let's talk about those scriptures real quick. Exodus 12, 15, and 20. And these are not exhaustive scriptures. It's just enough to kind of get through this and, and give a little bit of understanding. Exodus 12, 15 to 20. For seven days you are to eat matzah. On the first day, remove the leaven from your houses. For whoever eats hummets, which is leavened bread, le hummets or leavening, from the first to the seventh day is to be cut off from Israel. On the first and seventh days, you are to have an assembly set aside for God. On these days, no work is to be done except what each must do to prepare his food. You may only do that. You are to observe the festival of matzah, for on this very day I brought your divisions out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you are to observe this day from generation to generation by a perpetual regulation. From the evening of the 14th day of the first month until the evening of the 21st day, you are to eat matzah. For during those seven days, no leaven is to be found in your houses. Whoever eats food or with hummets in it is to be cut off from the community of Israel. It doesn't matter whether he's a foreigner or a citizen of the land. Eat nothing with hummets in it. Wherever you live, eat matzah. So in this scripture, it says, see, and this is why there's so much confusion about the calendars. In this scripture, it says, from the evening of the 14th day, to the 21st day is when you're supposed to eat matzah. But then there was another scripture that we read that said the 15th. I, I personally do not argue about calendars. I look at it as let us try to do the very best we can with the information that we have. Because when the Lord comes back, he's going he's gonna to straighten it all out. For all we know, we may all have the calendar wrong. And that's how I look at it. Exodus 13, 6 through 10. For seven days you are to eat matzah. On the seventh day is to be a festival for Adonai. Matzah is to be eaten throughout the seven days. Neither hummets nor, nor leavening agents are to be seen with you throughout your territory. On that day you are to tell your son, it is because of what Adonai did for me when I left Egypt. 
Moreover, it will serve you as as a sign on your hand and as a reminder between your eyes, so that Adonai's Torah may be on your lips, because with a strong hand Adonai brought you out of Egypt. Therefore, you are to observe this regulation at its proper time, year after year. So, when the Israelites were coming out of Egypt, again, they did not have the time to bake bread. They weren't going to. They had to have unleavened, unleavened bread, which is, is a very simple flat cracker. And you can find them in, in almost any grocery store. But something that's interesting to me, well, before I talk about that, during that period of time, leavening was sourdough. They would basically put out a mix, a slurry of flour and water to collect the wild yeast in the air, and they would use that starter to create the breads because they couldn't go to a grocery store and buy powdered yeast or baking powder or baking soda or any of these things. It was natural yeast from the air. And so when there is reference to the leavening, that's what it is. And so it kind of gives you pause when you think about people having sourdough starters that are like 100 years old. Because the Bible says every year as Passover is kind of wrapping up and leading straight into unleavened bread, there's not supposed to be any leavening in your house or anywhere in your land. That is why I did a um, sourdough starter video a while back and said that after Passover I will do another one showing how to catch the wild yeast. The first one I did used a starter. This one's not going to. It'll do wild yeast. But that's why I'm doing it after Passover because I don't want to be starting sourdough only to turn around and immediately dump it out. I do keep these feasts to, to the best of my understanding and the best of my ability. So, okay, Le Leviticus 23, 4 through, six, 4 through 8. These are the designated times of Adonai, the holy convocations that you are to proclaim at their designated times. And see, again, we're going to kind of touch on that 14th, 15th thing. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, between sundown and complete darkness, comes Pesach, Passover for Adonai. On the 15th day of the same month is a festival of matzah. For seven days, you are to eat matzah. On the first day, you are to have a holy convocation. Don't do any kind of ordinary work. Bring an offering made by fire to Adonai for seven days. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. Do not do any kind of ordinary work. So depending upon how you look at this, it could be that you have Passover and then there's seven days, making it kind of eight total of unleavened bread. Or maybe Passover is day one of unleavened bread. It, it's, it's, again, that's one of those things that is debated. And uh, in the New Testament, Paul says, study to show yourself approved. I believe it was Paul. That's what we're supposed to study. And work out our, our work it all out. And be convinced in our own mind how we're supposed to do this. Seek, you know, seeking prayer and, 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 and guidance from the Lord. Um, so one other thing about the unleavened bread that I just wanted to share that I found very interesting. Um, well, and the lamb. I learned recently that when... Now, we know that the, the lamb for the Passover meal was roasted by fire. And generally, that was put on a, on a spit and, and just roasted over the fire. So it was pierced by the spit to hold it over the fire to roast it. And we know there was no broken bones. And so this was a whole lamb that was roasted. And the way that they would eat it is they would just take their knives and they would cut pieces off. And you see like people roasting whole animals over fires like that. And they'll come and they'll just like cut it off, cut off the pieces to eat it. But this was a whole lamb, a whole lamb. 
and they would cut off the sections. And you think about it, when you're taking a knife and you're cutting off meat, it often comes off in strips. And when we look at matzah that you, that you buy or you see in the store, it has stripes on it and it's pierced. And it just really struck me how the lamb being cooked over the fire has been pierced to put on a, on a spit and it's got cuts in it taking the flesh off to be eaten. And it just really made me think of Yeshua being scourged because when he was, you know, whipped by Pontius Pilate's soldiers, they use a cat of nine tails, which had pieces of metal and glass and things in the end so that when he, it wasn't just a whip, it was a whip that ripped the flesh from the body. And it just made those two things, the lamb's body and Yeshua's body, having the flesh torn off, it, it just like struck me, the similarities. You know, but, and then just touching on the leavening too. I, I know I'm kind of going back and forth between the leavening and, you know, the unleavened bread and the lamb. But with, with the, um, the leavening, leavening in, in scripture represents sin and corruption and uh, things being contaminated by things that are ungodly. And some scriptures for that are Matthew 16, 5 through 12. The Talmudim disciples or apostles or you know, students in crossing to the other side of the lake had forgotten to bring any bread. So when Yeshua said to them, watch out, guard yourselves against the hummets leavening of the Pharisees and Sadducees, they thought he said it because they hadn't brought bread. But Yeshua, aware of this, said, such little trust you have. Why are you talking with each other about not having bread? Don't you understand yet? Don't you remember the five loaves of the 5,000, how many baskets you filled? Or the seven loaves of the of the 4,000, how many baskets you filled? How can you possibly think I was talking to you about bread? Guard yourselves from the hummets of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood. They were to guard themselves not from yeast for bread, but from the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Because remember, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were teaching their own teachings. They weren't teaching really the law of God anymore. They were they had their own teachings, teachings that they had created far above and beyond God's laws, and they were they were a horrible burden and essentially put God's people in slavery under them. Galatians 5, 9, it takes only a little hummus, a little leavening to leavening the whole batch of dough, which reminds me a lot of sourdough. And But if you think of sin, we have a little bit of sin. A little bit of sin leads to a lot of sin. It doesn't stop with a little bit. A little compromise leads to a lot of compromise. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 7 to 8. Get rid of the old hummet so that you can be a new batch of dough. Because in reality, you are unleavened. For our Passover lamb, our Pesach lamb, the Messiah, has been sacrificed. So let us celebrate the Seder, not with leftover hummets, but the hummets of, the hummets of wickedness and evil, but with the matzah of purity and truth. That hummus, or that um, that unleavened bread being pierced and striped, the, the way they cook it, the, like the way it's made, there's there's stripes in it. They're like um, golden brown. And and I I apologize for kind of jumping back and forth between the two. My my mind is just like thinking of different things as I'm going through it. But talking about the unleavened bread, the the matzah. And seeing the piercing and seeing the um, the golden stripes. Um, Zechariah 2 and 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and on those living in Jerusalem a spirit of grace and prayer. And they will look to me whom they pierced. 
They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and, son, and they will be in bitterness on his behalf like the bitterness for a firstborn son. Isaiah 53, 4 and 6. In fact, it was our diseases he bore, our pains for which he suffered. Yet we regarded him as punished, stricken and afflicted by God. But he was wounded because of our crimes, crushed because of our sins. The dis disciplining that makes us whole fell on him and by his bruises we are healed. We all like sheep went astray, we turned each one to his own way, yet Adonai laid on us, laid on him the guilt of all of us. And that word bruises is often translated as stripes. By his stripes we are healed, and the unleavened bread, the matzah, is pierced and has stripes. It just, I think it's beautiful symbolism. Um, so, uh, you know, unleavened bread, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is pretty uh, self-explanatory as far as how it's how it's kept. Um, no eating foods with leavening in it, particularly sourdough, but some people will remove all leavening from their house. No baking soda, no baking powder, no yeast, no nothing. Um, it's pretty much impossible to have no leavening in your house because yeast lives in the air. So... I would say for something like that, you know, use, go, do what you feel is right according to your convictions. Um, a lot of, I definitely will not have sourdough in my house. It will be all gone. Um, you know, there's often a game that is played by families who are keeping the feast. Like as, as they, you know, they keep Passover and they have unleavened bread with it and then what many will do because you have that 14th, 15th date thing is on the 15th, they will search their house. They'll make it a day of like a hide and seek with children. And what some of the parents will do is take like a piece of a cracker or a piece of a little morsel of bread and hide it somewhere. And we're searching the house. Everybody's searching the house, making sure there's no leavening anywhere. All the kids will go through and they'll look at everything. And whoever finds that little piece of leavening, they get a prize. So it, it's just a way to incorporate the kids into it and, and teach them. Um, because kids learn by doing. That That's why he says, when your sons ask why they do this, it's because of what the Lord did for us. And these are, all of the feasts are remembrances. They're, they're all teaching opportunities, not only for the next generation, but for us. So that kind of, kind of brings me to, oh, before I go on to the next thing, the Haggadah, the, the Seder meal. There is, of course, the traditional uh, Jewish version of it, but there are also, you can find Christian ones that use all of the symbolism of the sacrifice of Yeshua and kind of incorporate all of these things into that formal meal, if you want to go that route. Um, but the only thing that is required, according to scripture, is unleavened bread, bitter herbs. Whether you want lamb or not is up to you because Yeshua was our Passover lamb. There is no more sacrificing lambs. And so a lot of times people will cook lamb just as a remembrance because we're, we're commanded to remember. And they'll have it as a meal. It's not a sacrifice. It's just a meal. Or they'll do something else. Because I know, like, Orthodox Jews will not serve lamb because the lamb's only supposed to be sacrificed at the temple in the place where I put my name, the Lord says. And there isn't one. And so they'll have brisket or, you know, something else. It's still a special meal, but there's no lamb. So, you know, whether you want to serve lamb or not, totally up to you. We're commanded to do, bit, to do bitter herbs. We're commanded to make it a holy day, holy convocation. Same with the end of unleavened bread, the final day of unleavened bread, holy convocation, bitter herbs, holy convocation, unleavened bread. And again, lamb's up to you. All right, that brings us to the next feast. So we've gone through Passover. We've gone through unleavened bread. The next one is first fruits. And this is a very interesting one that a lot of Christians don't know anything about. Uh, 
Um, Leviticus 23, verses 9 through 14. Adonai said to Moshe, Tell the people of Israel, after you enter the land, I am giving you and harvest its ripe crops. You are to bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the Kohen. He is to wave the sheaf before Adonai so that you will be accepted. The Kohen is to wave it on the day after the Shabbat. On the day that you wave the sheaf, you are to offer a male lamb without defect in its first year as a burnt offering for Adonai. Its grain offering is to be one gallon of fine flour mixed with olive oil, an offering made by fire to Adonai as a fragrant aroma. Its drink offering is to be of wine, one quart. You are not to eat bread, dried grain, or fresh grain until the day you bring the offering for your God. This is a permanent regulation throughout all your generations, no matter where you live. And then Leviticus 23... Oh, no, we'll get to that one in a minute. So, first fruits is always on a Sunday. It is always on a Sunday because it falls after the weekly Shabbat. So depending upon when Passover is, the weekly Shabbat that comes after that Passover, the very next day is when first fruits is. And some years, the Passover Shabbat and the weekly Shabbat are back to back. So you have two Shabbats in a row. And then whatever, you know, the very next day being a Sunday, because regular weekly Shabbat's always Saturday, Sunday is first fruits, and that is when this this takes place. And they were not allowed to harvest anything from their fields until this took place. There was no harvest without first fruits. So what is so? So I'm wondering, do you see the do you see the um, the symbolism with that? Yeshua said, pray for, for workers in the fields. Pray for those harvesters because the harvester, the harvest is ready, but the workers are few. And he, he is referred to as our first, as the first fruits. And I just realized I am, I am missing a scripture. Hold on, let me pull this one up. First Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15, one through 26. Now brothers, I must remind you of the good news which I proclaimed to you and which you received on which you have taken your stand and by which you are being saved. Provided you keep holding fast to the message I proclaim to you. For if you don't, your trust will have been in vain. For among the first things I passed on to you was what I also received, namely this, the Messiah died for our sins in accordance to what the Tanakh says. He was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with what the Tanakh says. And he was seen by Kepha, Peter, then by the twelve. And afterwards he was seen by more than 500 brothers at one time, the majority of whom are still alive, though some have died. Later he was seen by Yaakov, Jacob, then by all the emissaries, and at last he, he was seen by me, even though I was born at the wrong time. For I am the least of all the emissaries, unfit to be called an emissary, because I persecuted the messianic community of God. But by God's grace I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I have worked harder than all of them, and although I was not but by the grace, although it was not I, but the grace of God with me. Anyhow, whether I or they, this is what we proclaim, and this is what you have believed. But if it has been proclaimed that, that the Messiah has been raised from the dead, how is it that some of you are saying there is no such thing as a resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then the Messiah has not been raised. And if the Messiah has not been raised, then what have we proclaimed is in vain. And also your trust is in vain. Furthermore, oh, did I write the wrong script? Oh, no. Furthermore, we are shown up as false witnesses for God in having testified that God raised up the Messiah, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then the Messiah has not been raised either. And if the Messiah has not been raised, your trust is useless and you are still in your sins. For if this is the case, those, those who died in union with the Messiah are lost. If it is only for this life that we have put in our hope in the Messiah, we are more pitiable than anyone but the fact is that the Messiah has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a man, 
also the resurrection of the dead has come through man. For just as in connection with Adam all die, so in connection with the Messiah we will all be made alive. But each in his own order, the Messiah is the first fruits, then those who belong to the Messiah at the time of his coming. Then the culmination, when he hands over the kingdom of God to God the Father, after having put an end to every rulership, yes, to every authority and power, for he has to rule until he puts all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be a done, with, done away with is death. Yeshua was the first fruits. Jesus was the first fruits. Most, a lot of believers don't know anything about first fruits. And yet, Yeshua, Jesus, was crucified and died on Passover. He was resurrected at first fruits. Because it was the first day of the week after the Passover and the Shabbat. Three days in the grave. First fruits. So first fruits is how's it celebrated? Um, there was the offering that was made, and the the grains, the sheep were 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 waved by the priest. And beyond that, there's really no other information other than to begin counting. Begin counting seven full weeks and then a day, fifty days. And when you look back in the Bible, you look back in Acts, you will see that those 50 days that are counted have meaning as well. Passover, unleavened bread, you have first fruits, and, those, and the, the beginning of the counting of 50 days. Well, Acts verse, chapter 1, verse 3 through 4. After his death, he showed himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. During a period of 40 days, they saw him, and he spoke with them about the kingdom of God. At one of these gatherings, he instructed them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father has promised, which you heard about from me. For John used to immerse people in water, but in a few days you will be immersed in the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. First fruits begins the counting of, of 50 days. No harvest could be done until first fruits. There was no resurrection until the first fruit was resurrected. Jesus walked the earth after his resurrection for 40 days and then he went away. He went up to heaven. 10 days after that, which we know as the 50th day, which is called Shavuot, which is um, we also know as Pentecost, which is the Greek name for it, meaning 50, 50 days, is when the Holy Spirit came. And that brings us to Shavuot. You know, we, we it, it's pretty amazing. Um, it, it's, it's when, when you start learning about the feasts of the Bible and learning about their meeting, Every single one of the feasts of the Bible, God's appointed times, they all point to Jesus. They all point to Yeshua. And so the idea that these things are only for the Jews, that's not what the Bible says. That's incorrect. And there's so much meaning. And, and this is, and really, as much as we're diving into this, this is really just an introduction there's, there's so much more. Um, but I do want to pause because there's something I forgot to mention. And that is, you know, like I said, we know the Bible calls Shavuot. Uh, Bible says Shavuot. We also know it as Pentecost because Pentecost is a Greek term. What really got me studying all of these things was when I got my first Bible dictionary and I, we were studying and reading in Acts. Was it Acts? Yes, in Acts. And at the time I had a King James Bible. That's what I used to use. And I'm not going to get into the arguments on Bibles. That's, you know what? You use the Bible that you're happy with. 
I'm just going to say that. But study. Because I, I don't think there's any Bible that's perfect. But I had a King James Bible at the time. And I ran, ran, ran across the scripture in Acts 12 that says the word Easter. And I couldn't understand what this word was. I, I, I am a person, when I read something, I want to know where it came from. What is the origin of this? Where does this tradition come from? What does this come, come from? I'm an origins studier. And so I pulled out my dictionary and I read what does the word Easter mean? This was the crock in the dam for me. And I'm just going to read you this. This is from the Vines Exposit Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words. Easter. Easter, G3957, Pascha, mistranslated Easter in Acts 12.4, denotes the Passover. The phrase after the Passover signifies after the whole festival was at an end. The term Easter is not of Christian origin. It is another form of a start, one of the titles of the Chaldean goddess, the Queen of Heaven. The festival of Pesach, or Pasch, held by Christians in post-apostolic times was a continuation of the Jewish feast, but it was not instituted by Christ, nor was it connected with Lent. From this Pach, the pagan festival of Easter was quite distinct and introduced into the apostate Western religion as part of the attempt to adapt pagan festivals to Christianity. The, the word Easter is the pagan goddess Astarte, Ostar, um, Ishtar, same, same goddess, different cultures, different name. She is celebrated. She is the goddess of the sun, the goddess of heaven, the goddess of fertility. And that is why Easter is celebrated with rabbits and eggs. It's fertility. Um, and there's references to it in Jeremiah 7, 18, 44, 17 to 19, um, about the queen of heaven and baking cakes for the queen of heaven and how these people were celebrating the queen of heaven while claiming they still were serving God. But something that really just got me was we took something that the Lord did for us in redeeming us from our sins and saving us from death. And we, we took this holy day of Passover and we, we Western, whatever Christianity, gave it the name Easter and called it by the name of a pagan goddess. Yet in Exodus 23, 13, it says, don't even let the names of these pagan deities be heard in your mouth. And it says right here in Vines, it says, see Passover. Passover, Pascha, the Greek spelling of the Aramaic word for the Passover from the Hebrew Pesach to Passover to spare, a feast instituted by God in commemoration of the deliverance of Israel from Egypt and anticipatory of the expi expiatory sacrifice of Christ. The word signifies the Passover feast. And when you look at this, this right here, this is just a printout of Acts 12 and 4, where in that King James Bible it said Easter, but it was mistranslated. This is just a printout of every version of the Bible that is on the, what is that name of the the website that I use when I'm printing out scriptures. I can't even think what it is off the top of my head now. Um, so you have the King James 21st century version. It says Easter. The American Standard Version, Passover. The Amplified Version, Passover. Passover, there's something called the BRG. I don't know what that Bible is called, what that is. Easter. The CSB, Passover. CEB, Passover. CJB, the one I use, Pesach. The CEV says just the festival. The Darby says the Passover, D-L-N-T, Passover. Pasch, Passover, 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 Feast, Passover, 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 
Passover feast, Passover season, Passover, Passover, King James Version, Pat Easter, A King James Version, American Maze, maybe, Easter, LSB, Passover, LEB, Passover, TLB, Passover, MSG, Passover week, Passover, 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 Passover feast, Passover, Passover feast, Passover, Passover. These are all different translations of the Bible. Passover, NLV, what is that, New Living Version? I don't know. It says, now this Bible, I would really question. Herod took Peter and put him in prison and had 16 soldiers watch him after the special religious gathering was over. It doesn't even say anything. What special religious ceremony? What, what were special religious gathering? NLT, Passover, 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 Pesach, Passover, 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 Feast, Pasch, Passover. Exodus 23, 13. Don't even let their names come out of your mouth. That is what led me down this path to begin with. So, that, so again, we're talking about um, first fruits, which begins the counting, called counting the Omer, um, which leads to Shavuot or Pentecost. We know that Jesus walked the earth for 40 days before he's taken up the heaven to heaven. Ten days later came Shavuot and Pentecost. Shavuot slash Pentecost. Deuteronomy 16, 9 through 12. You are to count seven weeks. You are to begin counting seven weeks from the time you first put your sickle to the standing grain, first fruits. You are to observe the festival of Shavuot, or also called Feast of Weeks, for Adonai your God with a voluntary offering, which you are to give in accordance with the degree to which Adonai your God has prospered you. You are to rejoice in the presence of Adonai your God, you, your sons, your daughters, your male and female slaves, the, the Levites living in your towns, and the foreigners, the orphans and widows living among you in the place where Adonai your God will choose to have his name live. Remember that you were a slave in Egypt. Then you will keep and obey these laws. Deuteronomy 26, 1 through 11, when you have come into the land, Adonai your God is giving you as your inheritance, taken possession of it and settled there. You are to take the first fruits of all the crops the grounds yield, the ground yields, which you will harvest from your land that Adonai your God is giving you. Put them in a basket and go to the place where Adonai your God will choose to have his name live. You will approach the Kohen holding office at that time and say to him, today I declare to Adonai your God that I have come to the land of Adonai, that to the land Adonai swore to our ancestors that he would give us. The Kohen will take the basket from your hand and put it down in front of the altar of Adonai your God. Then in the presence of Adonai your God, you are to say, my ancestor was a nomad from Aram. He went down into Egypt, few in number, and stayed. There he became a great, strong, populous nation. But the Egyptians treated us badly. They oppressed us and imposed harsh slavery on us. So we cried out to Adonai, the God of our ancestors. Adonai heard us and saw our misery, toil, and oppression. And Adonai brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand and an out, outstretched arm with great terror and signs and wonders. And now he has brought us to this place and given us this land, a land mo flowing with milk and honey. Therefore, as you see, I have now brought the first fruits of the land which you, Adonai, have given me. You are then to put the basket down before Adonai, your God. Prostrate yourself before Adonai, your God, and take joy in all the good that Adonai, your God, has given you, your household, the Levi, and the foreigner living with you. Every one of these feasts is about remembering what the Lord has done, remembering that we have been freed by the hand of God through the blood of the Lamb, and freed from the slavery, the bondage of sin. All of the feasts point to, the, point to Yeshua. All of them. Jesus. In Acts 2, verses 2 through 4, the festival of Shavuot arrived. Now remember, Jesus went up after walking for 40 days. He said, go there, wait. And in a few days, you're going to get the whole, you're going to get the helper, 
the one who is going to help you walk in my ways, the one who is going to give you the power to do the things that I want you to do. The festival of Shavuot arrived, and as the and the believers all gathered together in one place, suddenly there came a sound from the sky, like the roar of a violent wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then they saw what looked like tongues of fire, which were separated, and came to rest on each one of them. They were all filled with the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, and began to talk in different languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. So something that I learned a couple of years ago was about when Moses got the law from God up on Mount Sinai. How all of the people down at the base of the mountain, they heard the thunderings, they heard the voice of God up on top of that mountain. And the tradition was that all of the people who had come out of Egypt, because remember, it wasn't just Israelites who came out. There were mixed multitudes because when the uh, famine was taking place, it wasn't just the Israelites who went to Egypt to, to get grain and eventually sold themselves into slavery, slavery to Egypt. There were people all around from all these different lands who, who came in. This mixed multitude had become slaves under Egypt because they were all trying to survive this famine. And so when Israel came out of Egypt, so did a mixed multitude, meaning a whole bunch of people who spoke a whole bunch of languages. And the, the tradition that has been passed down in the Jewish community is that when Moses got the law and they could all hear the voice of God up there, the thunderings and all of this stuff, that they all heard God's words, God's laws being spoken in their own languages. And so the people who were there in Jerusalem from all these different places, because this very special feast of Shavuot was taking place, all heard the words being spoken in their own languages. I mean, that's like, wow. Because God repeats important things on the same days. When you look at the, at the history and you look at things that took place, there are very often like a certain day that this happened and this happened and this happened all on that same day. These days that were chosen for Passover, for the sacrifice of Yeshua, Jesus, for him being crucified, for him being resurrected, for the Holy Spirit being given to the believers so that they would have the power and the ability to serve the Father. Those weren't accidental dates. Those were feasts of the Lord, appointed, special, holy times. It's just, it's amazing when you start really understanding these and really studying them. And it's like every year I learn something new that just blows my mind. And I'll just, I'll just kind of wrap the study portion up with this. I, I don't have much left. <laughs> I'm already at this for an hour and a half. All of the spring feasts of the Lord of Adonai, of Yah. All of the spring feasts are Yeshua's first coming. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Shavuot. He fulfilled them. He fulfilled the feasts in his first coming. And there is much evidence to believe that the fall feasts will be fulfilled at his second. And if that doesn't make you want to study the feast, the feasts of the Bible, the feasts of God, I don't know what would. It is beautiful. They are rich. They are full of meaning. And these are not Jewish holidays. They are God's appointed times. God's beautiful, holy, and special days. Rich in meaning. So, I'm just going to share with you some of the resources that I have used. Well, I have, I have, I have lots of books. 
But these three, I've talked about them before, but I'm just going to share them again. If you want to learn more about the Feasts of the Bible, the Feasts of the Lord, and their significance with, Shishu, with Yeshua, Jesus, these are the books I recommend. Number one is this one, Messiah and the Feasts of Israel by Sam Nadler. Um, I do have links to all of these books in my Amazon shop. Please don't go there today. It is Shabbat. Just make a note, go tomorrow or after sunset tonight, wherever you live. Messiah in the Feasts of Israel. And I'll just read you the back. God's redemptive plan is unveiled through the Feasts of Israel. Discover how God's appointed times are still relevant for our lives today and how they point to our glorious future with Messiah. This book will deepen your understanding of the prophetic purposes of the Feasts of Israel because each feast is prophetic. How the feasts are fulfilled in Messiah, the future implication of the feasts, and the eternal and practical truths for your life. Um, this... This is probably my favorite book about the feasts, besides the Bible itself. Um, I have bought many, many copies of this book. I have given this book to I don't know how many people over the years. Um, this book is very similar. Um, it's, it's a little bit smaller. I think it costs a little bit less. And it is God's Appointed Times, A Practical Guide for Understanding and Celebrating the Biblical Holidays by Barney Kasdan. And this goes through every one of the feasts. And, and actually, all of the books that I'm talking about not only talk about the feasts of the Lord, so all of the God's appointed times, but then also the extra biblical um, feasts, such as Purim, which is tomorrow, and Hanukkah. So it explains them. This one goes through the meaning, the background of the, of the feast, the meaning of the feast, how they point to Yeshua, and then it shows you a, like a, just a brief introduction to how it's traditionally celebrated or kept, and then how someone who is a believer in Messiah, Jesus, a Christian, would, would maybe want to think about celebrating them. It's just got some ideas. And then there's this one. This is essentially a homeschool unit study curriculum book all about the biblical holidays, a.k.a. the Feasts of the Lord. And it has... Um, it, it also briefly explains the symbolism, the meaning behind all of the feasts. Um, it talks about... Um, it also goes into, um, the extra biblical feasts like Purim, Hanukkah, but there's tons of ideas for kids. There's, uh, word searches, there's crosswords, there's coloring pages, there's craft ideas, there's recipes. This is all about making the feasts a family event, especially for the children, because that's how they learn. They learn by doing and so, um, again, these, you can find them in my Amazon link in the library section. I have it all divided up in there. Don't go there today. Maybe go there tomorrow. Um, my planner comes from Daily Bread for Busy Moms. And the Bible I've been reading from is the Complete Jewish Study Bible. So, um, again, I did have the chat turned off for today. However, if you have questions, you can leave them in the comment section. The regular comment sh section should be open underneath this video, um, and it will be available for replay later on. If you have any questions, I don't have all the answers, but I will do my best <laughs> to answer what I can. Um, I can maybe do that ne in next week's Saturday video. So if there's some questions down there, um, you can you can leave them down there. And like I said, I, I will do my best. I'm still learning. I, I don't have all the answers. I, I every and like I said, every year I learn something new that I didn't realize before. And I don't get I don't get wrapped around the axle about the calendar. Um, like I said, when the Lord comes back, he'll set it right. You know, maybe we're all on the wrong calendar. Who knows? But we should do it to the best of our ability with the understanding that we have. And when you start studying the feasts, they will just, it'll just blow your mind how 
amazing they are and how the Lord had this all planned out from the beginning. So with that, thank you for joining me here today. Thank you for all of you who have stuck with for this whole thing. Um, I know I just kind of moved through it very quickly, but there was a lot to get through and um, I, I don't know how I could do just one and not touch not touch on all of them because they're all connected. They're all the first coming. They're all they're all the plan of salvation, really. And so um, that is it for today. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend and uh, Shabbat Shalom.